Welcome to EE698i Mixed Signal IC Design. This is lecture number three. In the previous classes, we discussed about sampling, that is how to convert a continuous time signal to a discrete time signal. And we also saw about the reverse process, that is how to reconstruct the continuous time signal from the discrete time samples. So next stop is quantization. As we saw in the first class, quantization is the last step after sampling to convert a signal from analog to digital. Right? So first let's quickly understand what quantization does. So let us say this is my discrete time sequence obtained after sampling. So this is the time axis n. This is the amplitude axis. Say this is n equal to 0, 1, 2, and so. In sampling, what we did, we took this time axis and discretized it to discrete time instance, right? So we have only discrete time instance marked here. So we'll do the same thing in quantization, but we'll do that for the amplitude axis. That is, instead of allowing all possible amplitude values, we will say that we'll allow only discrete amplitude levels marked by this cross. So what that means, well, we'll say that any input lying within this range is mapped to this voltage. Within this range, we'll map it to this voltage. Within this range, we will map it to this voltage and so on. Okay. So let's say if I my x of n, that is a discrete time samples are like this. So let's say it is this. So second sample, let's say it's somewhere here. And the third sample is somewhere here. So what I do, I find that my first sample is lying in this region, right? So I'll quantize it to this amplitude. Similarly, the second amplitude lies in this region. So I'll quantize it to this amplitude. Similarly, the third one, I'll quantize it to this amplitude. Since we have a finite number of amplitude levels, we can code them using binary bits, right? And in general, if we have two power n levels, we can code them using n bits, right? Now let us see how the input output characteristics of quantization, that is the quantization operation looks like. So let's say this is my input axis, and let's say the input is u, here I have the output, which I call V. So what do we do? Well, as we saw here, we divide the amplitude into multiple regions like this, right? And then for that particular region, we assign a particular amplitude. So these are the regions that are marked by these values. And any input lying within this region, I will say that it is getting mapped to this value. Similarly, in the next region, I'll say, I'll map it to this voltage and third region like this and so on, right? When I join it, you can see that this looks like a staircase response, like it's a staircase characteristics. Right? So in this characteristics, let's say if I keep extending it to the negative voltages also, so there are two possible values for zero to be, right? One, it can be anywhere in between, say that is here, or zero volts can be at this point where we have this jump. And depending on these two possibilities, we have two different types of quantizers, okay? The first type is called mid thread quantizer, and it has a characteristics like this. So this is my, input taxes u, this is my output taxes v. And in a mid thread quantizer, zero is one of the permissible output levels. So we'll have the first level at zero, I mean one of the levels at zero. And the rest of the characteristics will look something like this. On the other hand, we'll have a mid rise quantizer and its characteristics will look like this. So again, let's see, this is the input U, the output P. 
here zero is not one of the allowed levels so we'll have this jump at zero and then the characteristics will look like this so for a metered quantizer zero is an allowed output level so what does this mean if let us say the input to the quantizer is zero okay so what will happen to the output the output will also be zero because zero is one of the levels allowed here but in a mid rise quantizer what happens well zero is not an allowed level so the output can actually lie anywhere in these two levels right but in practice what we'll have is that along with the input we will also be processing random circuit noise so because of that the input will not be exactly at zero that is at this point it might wiggle around zero right as a result for an input of zero output will keep toggling between two levels in a mid rise context okay on the other hand if you take a mid rate quantizer since zero is one of the levels the characteristic is asymmetric that is we will have let us say we have even number of levels in total right here i have taken eight levels since zero is permitted here i'll have three levels in the positive and i'll have four levels in the negative right for the negative voltage so this will have an asymmetric response whereas here since we are jumping around zero we can have same number of levels on both the positive and the negative sides so here it will be symmetric right asymmetric response for even number of levels well if i have to make the mid rise quantizer to have a symmetric characteristic what do i do i'll have to add one more level here right so it becomes an a quantizer with odd number of levels so let's look at a mid rise quantizer and see it in detail well let's say the input can take values from between a minimum voltage say i call it minus vrf and a maximum voltage of plus vrf in a mid rise quantizer since zero is not an allowed level i'll compare with zero so i'll divide the regions as this so let's say i have i am considering a 2 bit adc that is a 2 bit quantizer so which means i will have four possible output amplitudes right so what do i have to do i have to divide this range from minus vrf to plus vrf into four regions right so since with zero i have divided into two regions so i'll divide these further like this so this level is what vrf by 2 this is minus vrf by 2 okay so we have four regions here 1 2 3 and 4 and what we'll do we'll say that any input lying in this range that is the lower range here we'll map it to a value that is somewhere in between say it's minus 3 4 3f similarly for the upper uh, range here here we'll map it to minus 1 4 3f so here we'll map it to vrf by 4 here it's again plus 3 3 vrf by 4 okay again since we have only four levels we can encode these levels using two bits so this can be mapped as 00 01 101 okay so let's see how the input output characteristics looks for this so let me draw the curves lines here so this is my input u this is my output so first region we see that here in the positive side the first region is from 0 to vrf by 2 right so first let me mark the values this is say vrf by 2 this is vrf similarly on the negative side i have minus vrf by 2 and minus vrf okay 
it may also mark the same on the y-axis as well. So let's say this is VRef by 2. This is, let's say, VRef. And let's say this is minus VRef by 2 and minus VRef. So this is essentially a straight line passing through the origin. And what does this line represent? It represents the equation V equal to E. Fine. So now let's plot the quantizer characteristics. So between zero to VRef by two, we say that the output is mapped to VRef by four. So this is VRef by four. So in the y-axis, we'll have VRef by four here. So what we say between zero and VRef by two, we'll map it to VRef by four like this, right? So similarly for the next range, we'll map it to three VRef by four. And I'll have a similar characteristics in the negative side as well. Okay. Now some terminologies. So this width, which is the width of any given region here, right? That is called the step size. And it is denoted by the symbol delta. Please note that this width is also equal to this width, right? So let me mark these values once again. So what is this? This is Vref by 4, right? This is minus Vref by 4. That is this point. Okay. And in this case, what is the step size delta? It is Vref by 2. So in general, for an n bit quantizer, which has 2 power n levels, what is the step size? Well, we have the input ranging from minus VREF to plus VREF. So we have a total of two VREF and this should be divided among two power n levels. So the step size is two VREF by two power n. Fine. So the symbol for the quantizer is this. So it is usually denoted by this block with a star case shown. Okay, so this is the input u and the output v. So let's see if we can actually try to analyze this quantization operation in detail. Okay. Well, if you look at this input output characteristics, we can clearly notice that this is a nonlinear characteristic, right? Because let's say for this input voltage, this input value, we get this output. If I scale the input to another value, say to this point, the output is remaining the same. Right, so this is clearly non-linear. On top of this, we also have sudden jumps here, right? Abrupt jumps in the response. So this kind of makes it extremely difficult to completely sit and analyze this operation. Okay, but of course you can rigorously do it, but the end result will be pages and pages of tedious math. And one thing that engineers absolutely hate is long mathematical calculations, right? So what the engineers do, that is what we do is the following. Well, this is the input u, the output v. I know that the input is not the same as the output. So we'll model this simply as an error getting added to the input. So the output v is the input u plus an error q, which is called the quantization. Okay, so now that we have modeled it as u plus q, let's understand how quantization error looks like. We'll try to get some insights about this quantization error. For that, first let me copy this characteristic. So here we know that step size is delta, that is Vref by two. So I'll change these. So just change this value from Vref by two to delta. So this is minus delta, right? And this point is what? That is Vref by four. I'll mark it as delta by two. 
Similarly, this point is minus delta by 2. Okay. And what is V? We define the output V to be input Q plus the quantization error Q. So which means to find the quantization error, I need to subtract the input from the output. Okay. So here we see that this curve, that is the staircase curve, represents the output. Whereas this line that I'm drawing now in white thick line is the same as the input, right? So this is a curve V equal to U, right? So what I have to do, I have to take the difference between this staircase curve and this straight line. So let's see what happens. Oops, let me draw the axis again. So this is the input Q. In the Y axis, I have the quantization error Q. Okay, that's what I'm going to plot. Well, at zero, we see that the output, that is V, is jumping to plus delta by two, right? On the positive voltage side. So on the positive side, this will jump to plus delta by two. And as input increases, the output remains constant, right? So as the input increases linearly, output is constant. So we know Q is V minus U. So here the output V is remaining constant, input Q is increasing. So the quantization noise will keep reducing. And at this point, it exactly becomes zero, right? Because input is becoming equal to the output, right? At this point, what happens? This is delta, that is the input is delta, output is delta by two. So Q is delta by two minus delta. So it reaches minus delta by two. So at this point, output reaches minus delta by two, right? And immediately after this point, that is once the input crosses delta, the output jumps, right? So what will happen? The quantization error will also jump and it will jump to plus delta by two. And then we'll have the same thing, right? At this point, it becomes zero and then it goes. And beyond this VREF, so this VREF is when it will again become minus delta by two, right? And beyond this point, we see that the output is saturated, right? Output is same. So if we keep increasing the input, the quantization error will keep increasing like this. So similarly on the negative side, we'll have a characteristic, similar characteristic. So let me just draw it roughly on the negative side. So we'll have something like this, okay? Well, some more terminology. So let me go to this curve. So here, this range from minus VREF to plus VREF, right? So let me mark it here. So this range is the permissible input range to the quantizer, right? So this is also called as full scale range or FSR, okay? And if an input is given to the quantizer beyond this full scale range, Right? That is, if, an, if the input is less than minus VREF or if it exceeds VREF, we call that, we say that the quantizer is overloaded. Okay. So we can see that as long as the input is within minus VREF and plus VREF, that is, if the quantizer is not overloaded, the quantization error is bounded between minus delta by two to plus delta by two, right? So this is one observation we can make about the quantization error. So Q is between, let me push this one, between minus delta by two to plus delta by two, okay? But this is not good enough information, right? So we just know quantization noise is bounded between minus delta by two to plus delta by two. And this is simply not good enough to analyze quantizer completely, right? So what engineers do? Well, we do more practical assumptions. So we make some more practical assumptions about the quantization error. And 
most of these assumptions might not even make sense and it might even sound very atrocious right but surprisingly it holds very well in practice so it sort of works that's all so the first assumption is that well the difficulty here was that this quantization error q right is strongly dependent on the input right so that's why it sort of is difficult to analyze the quantization process properly so what is assumed is that this quantization error is independent of the signal okay well so what if since it's independent of the signal we can treat it as a noise right so it's sort of a random signal now so because of this quantization error is also synonymously called as quantization noise okay now that we are saying that quantization error can be treated as a random signal we need to say we need to uh, say something about the probability distribution right since it's a random signal we need to say something about its statistics and the second assumption is second assumption is we make is regarding the statistics and it is that quantization error is uniformly distributed between minus delta by 2 and plus delta by 2 okay well from this graph we see that the quantization error is definitely lying between minus delta by 2 and plus delta by 2 right but the distribution can be anything right it could have been a gaussian or you know some other random distribution like this but instead we assume that between minus delta by 2 to plus delta by 2 it has a uniform distribution right this simplifies the analysis that's all so let's see if these assumptions actually hold good in practice and how will it holds good okay so for that let's consider an example so let's say i have a signal which i call u of t as cos 2 pi into 2 not 1 t so it's essentially a sinusoid with a frequency of 201 hertz okay so i'm going to sample it at a frequency 1 kilohertz that is 1000 hertz so what is the discrete time sequence i get u of n is cos of 2 pi into 201 into in ts i know that ts is 1 over fs and fs is this right fs is 1000 so what i can write i can make ts as 1 by 1000 right so after sampling i take 1000 samples of these and feed it to a quantizer okay and then i try to find what is the distribution or the histogram of this quantization error and what i get is this okay so this is when uh, when we use a two bit quantizer right we can see that the distribution that is a hist or the histogram is more or less uniformly distributed right it is not exactly uniform but it's approximately uniform okay and when i use a three bit quantizer i get this response and again we see that the quantization error is more or less approximately uniformly distributed okay next what i did is that i took instead of giving a sinusoidal signal i used a ramp signal that is i took a signal that is increasing from minus vrf to plus vrf as the signal and in this case we find that the quantization error is more uniformly distributed right in this case the approximation is even valid even more valid okay and this is the characteristic or this is the uh, histogram i get when i used a three bit quantizer with the same ramp signal right again we see it's more or less uniform so with this you might sort of get convinced that in practice the quantization distri the distribution of the quantization error is sort of uniform but before jumping to conclusion let's look at this signal uh, that is u of t say this is again a sinusoid but it's a frequency of 200 hertz okay earlier we had 201 hertz so this time let's say we take a signal it a frequency 200 hertz and let's say i'm sampling it 
let's say thousand hertz. Okay, so what is the discrete time sequence I get? So I get u of n as cos two pi into two hundred into n T S. Again, I'll replace T S as one over thousand, and I'll get this thing. Right? Again, I'm going to take thousand samples. And feed it to a quantizer. Okay, and I'm going to see the histogram of the quantization error. Well, and this is how the quantization error looks like when I use a two-bit quantizer. So this clearly shows that the distribution is no longer uniform now, right? And similarly with the three-bit quantizer, this is what I get. Again, this is definitely not uniformly distributed. So what's happening? Well, if you stare at the signal, you can find the reason. Okay, so I suggest you pause the video and see if you can find why what's happening here. Well, if you have found out, it's great. If not, let's find out the reason. So this signal, right? We can simplify it further, right? So how can it? How can we simplify it? It is cos two pi into this two hundred and thousand cancel off. So we end up with one fifth of n. Right, so this is a sinusoidal signal, but what is the period of the signal? It is just five samples, right? So what it means is that we have only five distinct amplitudes for the signal. So even though I take thousand samples, I have only five distinct values in this. Okay, so this you can clearly see from this plot. Right, so these are the five distinct samples. So this is the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, and then we have the same samples getting repeated. Okay, so as a result, so say this is the quantizer characteristics. So we are sort of exercising only let's say two or three levels of the quantizer because of this. So that is why the quantization error is not uniformly distributed. Okay, this is unlike the first case. Where we had a sinusoid with a frequency two hundred and one hertz. So with this choice, the discrete time sequence was this, right? Cos of two pi into two hundred and one by thousand times n, right? So which means this has a period of thousand samples. Okay. So if I take thousand samples of this sequence and then give it to a quantizer, all these thousand samples will be distinct. So, which means I will be exercising all possible input voltages to the quantizer, right? A similar thing happened with the ramp signal, right? So, I, we were exercising all possible input voltages to the quantizer, and that is why the quantization uh, error had uniform distribution. Okay. So, what's the conclusion? Well, as long as you make sure that you the input voltage spans a wide range of amplitudes, that is the entire range for the quantizer. The quantization error can be approximated to have a uniform distribution. Okay, and in practice, we'll have such kind of BC signals. So this approximation holds good. Okay, well now that we are convinced that this quantization error or the quantization noise has a uniform distribution, so let's try to get some more information from this. So we know that the PDF is uniformly distributed. So how does it look? So it's minus delta by two plus delta by two. We have this uniform distribution, and this is zero. This is p of t. Okay. So what is this value? If I say this is p naught, what is p naught? Well, we know the total area under the curve. This is one, right? So what is the area? P naught times delta, which is one. So p naught is one over delta. Right. So first, let's find the mean of the quantization noise. So what is mean? Well, from this we can clearly see that mean is zero because it is taking both positive and negative values with equal probability. Right. But let's say we calculate it more properly. So mean is what? It's expectation of Q. And how do you find it? We take Q times P of Q dQ from minus delta by two to plus delta by two. And P of Q we know is a constant. It's one by delta, so I'll take it out. So we'll have this 
minus delta by two to plus delta by two q times dq. And we know q is an odd function. And since we are integrating from minus delta by two to plus delta by two, this is just equal to zero, right? Next, let's try to find the variance. Okay. So what is variance? It is expectation of q minus the mean squared. Here, the mean is zero, right? This is the mean. This is simply equal to expectation of q squared. And what is that? It is integral minus delta by two to plus delta by two q squared times p of q dq. Again, p of q is constant, we'll take it out. We'll have minus delta by two to plus delta by two q squared dq, right? Now this is an even function. So we can simplify it as this two times zero to delta by two q squared dq. We can easily find this to be equal to delta squared by 12. Okay. So this is the quantization noise variance or the quantization noise power. Okay. And here, what is delta? Delta is the step size of the quantizer. And what is it equal to? If the input is ranging from minus Vref to plus Vref, delta is 2 Vref by 2 power n, where n is the number of bits used for encoding the quantizer. Fine. So now we know that the quantization noise power is delta squared by 12. And we know what is delta, it is 2 Vref by 2 power n. So I'll have this whole square by 12. So what does this simplify to? We'll have Vref square times 3 into 2 power 2n. It is simply Vref square by 3 into 4 power n. Well, for this quantizer, we assume that the maximum and minimum voltages are Vref and minus Vref, right? So what is the maximum sinusoidal signal that we can apply? So we can apply a sinusoid with an amplitude of Vref, right, like this. So which means what is the maximum sinusoidal signal power? Well, we know the maximum amplitude is Vref, so the maximum power is, power is Vref squared by 2, okay? So if we take the ratio of the signal power and noise power, that is quantization noise power, we will get what is known as SQNR, which is signal to quantization noise ratio. Okay. And what is this? This is ratio of signal power that is Vf squared by 2 divided by quantization noise power, which is Vf squared by 3 times 4 power n. So what does this simplify to? We have three half times four power. So if we express this SQNR in dB, which is how we'll do in practice, what is this? Well, you can simply calculate it and you can find it to be 6.02 N plus 1.76 dB, right? So it's roughly six N plus 1.76. So let's say you take an ADC, right? And if you have a five bit ADC, what is the maximum signal to quantization noise ratio? So that's around 32 dB, right, roughly. Right, so similarly for a 10 bit ADC, roughly you have 62 dB, okay? And remember, this is the signal to quantization noise ratio measured for a sinusoidal signal, okay? And this is what we typically do for characterizing the ADC as well. And what is SQNR again? So that is 6n plus 1.76, right? And here n is the number of bits, right? So if I increase n by one bit, how much does SQNR improve? It improves by 6 dB, right? This is simple. okay. So we'll stop at this point and continue in the next class.